Amy Porterfield is an internationally known expert in digital marketing. She's been named one of the top 50 most influential people in social media in the world. In the last 10 years, she's helped hundreds of thousands of subscribers through her multi-million dollar online course, Empire. But at her core, Amy stands for freedom. Freedom to be your own boss and make your own rules. And on top of that, she teaches and encourages with love because she's been there and she knows what it takes to create the life you really want. This is Amy Porterfield, The Liberator. How are we doing today? I'm great. I've really <laughs> been looking forward to this. This is such a great show. I love the topic. So thanks oh, for having me. Good. And I know it's something that's really important to you because from the beginning, you've been helping people really, uh, maybe in a different sort of set of language, but you've also been helping people find their purpose and what it is that they're supposed to really do. Yeah. Um, under the kind of guise of digital businesses, which I find just really interesting because it does give people freedom. But I, I, I think what I'm most interested in is your personal journey, okay. you know, because I think there's so much power as we share what we've been through, because it does, I think, shine a light for other people to understand, you know, there is life on the other side, you yes. know, when you have the courage, you take the risk and you do it. Like what does, what comes out of that, you know? And I think you're living that. So anyone who follows you knows that you've had this just beautiful meteoric rise of a business where you're helping so many thousands of people, but take me back to 2008, uh, maybe even 2007, Amy. Okay, so I was a corporate girl at that time. I was working for peak performance coach, Tony Robbins, and I was the director of content development. So I got to work on the content that Tony does on stage. So anyone who knows Tony would know, Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny. These are the events I got to work on in content. And what happened was I, I was there for about seven years, I loved my job. I loved working with Tony. I made great money. I had the security and the benefits and, you know, the bi-weekly paycheck, all good. Yeah. But there was one meeting that changed my life forever. And what happened was Tony brought in a bunch of internet marketers into the San Diego office to talk about how they sold their, their courses online, their digital courses, how they made money, because we wanted to get more into the online space at the Robbins Institute. This does feel like very early on in the, in the, very in the journey. Early like on, that's because, really inception type Yes, stuff. very much so. So he brought in um, a bunch of people to talk about their online businesses. And these were like the top of the top internet marketers. We call them like the grandfathers, the Mac daddies. I didn't know who they were at the time. Now I do. One thing that stuck out, there was not one woman at that mm -hmm. table. And this is very humbling. I was brought in to take notes. <laughs> and so there's this big oak like table. This. Yes. Big oak table. I was at a side table mm -hmm. and I was typing away, probably took the worst notes of my life because the guys went around and talked about their businesses. They talked about the money they made, the people they served, the kind of cre uh, creativity they had, what they were creating. And all I heard was freedom. Mm. All I heard was they're calling the shots, working when they want, how they want to work, where they want to work. And although I loved my corporate job, I thought, I don't have freedom. Mm. I had just gotten married and was traveling every single day, hardly saw my new husband. Mm. And I just thought, this isn't really the life I want. But that was the moment. I didn't even know that. Yeah. But here's what was interesting. In that moment, I turned to my girlfriend who was I was working with and I said, you're a writer. You have something that would translate into the online space. I have nothing. Oh. I, I, you know, I'm a corporate girl for life. Oh. I have nothing. <laughs> and she said, I don't think that's true. Yeah, yeah. So over the next year, I started to unpack that. Okay. So what did you unpack? What did you discover? So what I discovered, so I stayed there for about a year after that pivotal meeting and I decided I want to go out on my own. I want to create a business. Not really sure what I would do. Yeah. Like what is that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I was doing some social media and content writing at the Robbins group. So I, I had that under my belt, but I wasn't really sure. So I just started to pay attention to what everyone was doing online and just kind of see what sparked my interest. Also, while I was still there, I asked to move to the marketing department. Oh. And if I could work on these launches that they were starting to do based on what they were learning at that table. Mm. And they said, yes. So now I started to learn a new trait, got my hands into the marketing world, loved every minute of it. And so about six months after that is when I took the big leap 
and I went out on my own. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious when you made that transition kind of into marketing, was this one of those things where you're like in the back of your mind, like, I hope no one figures this out. I have long term plans that don't involve this place. Like, yes. get me back in that That's headspace. A great question. I've never been asked that question. Absolutely. And I was a little bit nervous, like. I kind of felt a little guilty. What, what if I leave and they give me this opportunity in marketing? Or what if someone finds out that I really want to go out on my own? So I think I was a little bit nervous, had some anxious energy that entire time. But I also knew that what I was learning, I was showing up. I was working the long hours, working weekends, hustling to show them like, no, I really want to be here. Yeah, yeah. And so I felt like I was showing up 100%. But I knew in the back of my mind, I, I had one foot out yeah, at that point. Yeah. And also, here's another question about that very specific chapter in the in the like transition journey, right? Out of that corporate career. Uh, did you know how long you'd stay? Mm. So I didn't at first. When when I was in that meeting, I just thought, this seems crazy that I would ever leave and yeah. become never yeah. in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be an entrepreneur. I didn't grow up with that. I didn't um, ever aspire to that. I love climbing the call. Uh, corporate ladder. Yeah. I love the accolades. I love the bonuses. I right. love the security. So never did I think that. But about six months into that journey, I thought, I I've got to choose an exit date. Okay. Because I was starting to feel like there's no no end in sight. Like yeah. I knew I wanted something new, but when was it going to come? Okay. So what I teach my students today is choose an exit date. You put that on a post-it note and you put it somewhere you see it every day. Yeah. I don't care if it's six months from now, a year from now, you got to know when you're going to make the jump. And how do you choose the date? Okay. So that is such a <laughs> great question because it's very scary. So what I usually tell my students is you've got to look at a few things. Number one, you do not need a huge nest egg. It, we all want it, but I sure as heck didn't have a bunch of money when I left. But you want a little money put aside just so you can get your footing when you go out on your own. So we look at having a little bit of savings, a little. Uh, also, what are you going to do? Can you set it up now? Can you have a side hustle while you're mm -hmm. in your corporate job so that you can start to kind of play around with what you want to do? A lot of my students aren't even sure what they want to do yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just have They're like that. testing the waters. Yeah. And they have that knowing like, I want something different for myself. Yeah. I know my life can be different. A lot of my students, they're women and they'll tell me, all I wanted to do is be home when my, my son came home from school at mm. three o'clock. Like, mm. I just want to be heart. there for him, right? You get it. <laughs> I, I do. Uh, I do get it. <laughs> it just makes such a difference. Or I want to stop saying, no, I can't come to your football game. I'll be yeah. out on the road or yeah. whatever it might be. So you start to answer your question. You want to start thinking about what would life look like? What mm. would you do? How would you make money? Start formulating a plan and ask yourself, how long is that going to take? Yeah. Now, I always say, but, you know, be a little aggressive there. Like, yeah. don't say, okay, in three years, because <laughs> no one's inspired by that. Right, right. But we usually around three, six, nine, 12 months, I kind of encourage, yeah. let's choose the date. Well, that that does give like urgency, right? Yes. And we all, we're hardwired to respond to urgency. We just are. You know, if something needs to be taken care of right now, we okay, we're going to take care of it right now. Yeah. We can spend our lives and our, our days putting out fires, fire, 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 fire. And then we realized, oh, we didn't do anything we were supposed to do. Yes. So if you create, if you allow the, that long-term plan to become urgent, then you've actually made it something that needs to be taken care of. And I so love, true. I love that. I love that. So you're like, okay, in six months, this is going to happen. And just for, give me a moment here. What did your husband say <laughs> when you're like so, in six months? Yes. <laughs> he actually, this is, I am very fortunate. He, he was all for it. He said, let's do it. I'm ready. He knew I, as much as I love my job, I was very stressed out. Like yeah. at the end, I was very overwhelmed. Funny enough, you get into your own online business. You're very stressed out. You're <laughs> very overwhelmed. But it's different. It, it it's is different, different because it's for you. You're so you're, you're right. Doing it for you. Yes. So you're like, there's, I, I see there's a reason for it. Yes. Right? When you're doing it for someone else, it's like, why? Building <laughs> someone else's empire and working all those hours and on the road, that gets tough. And I don't believe everybody is meant to not be in a nine to five job. Some people thrive and do amazing mm -hmm. things. Other people feel that calling and just not sure what to do with it. But yeah, when I went to my husband and said, I want to do it, he was all for it. Thank God, because I know many of my students, their their spouses yeah. are not. Yeah. And they're not supportive or or maybe they're even further along in their family. Right. So they have yeah. things like they have the financial implications. They have the commitments that they have to so take true. care of. And it's like, how yeah. do we, how, how do we do this? Okay. So let's keep going chronologically here. So you're like, here's my six month date. I'm going to leave. 
Yes. I mean, what happens when you're like, I'm going to put in my notice and then people are like, <gasps> oh, and they're and they're putting their fear on you. Like, oh, what is that like? This is such a great conversation because one of the things I was embarrassed to tell people what I wanted to do, what I really thought. So I turned to my husband right before I took the big leap and left. And I said, I'm embarrassed to put out blog posts. So to to tell you, I went off to do social media. I taught people how to do social media. That's the first thing I did when I left. But I told my husband, I'm gearing up for this and I want to write blog posts about it and post on, at the time, Twitter was really, really hot above mm -hmm. all else. And I said, I'm embarrassed what my coworkers are going to think. I'm embarrassed what Tony's going to think. Mm -hmm. I'm just embarrassed that they're going to say, what is she? She doesn't know who, enough. Who, who is, is she? she? Yeah. Who is she to do that? Yeah. Two things came out of that. My husband so kindly said, babe, I love you, but Tony's not worried about what you're going to do. <laughs> and your coworkers aren't either. Everyone's worried about themselves. Yeah, you know, it's we're true. doing our own thing. That's a major self-awareness. Major. Good I was like, him. ooh, that hurts, but you're totally right. <laughs> and so I remembered, like, no one cares as much as I do. But the second thing was that I needed to feel that anxiousness, that energy, just to be like, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm scared, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm scared but do it anyway is literally a message i tell my students every day because yeah. i don't think you can change your life and not feel a little scared yeah yeah i do wonder um in your experience if there's like sensation that goes along with that like we're doing a lot of like thinking but feeling but really thinking a lot thinking a lot but there's got to be some understanding of how you feel in that because you don't just leave a safe situation yeah. unless you feel like there's something either calling you or pushing you to the next step so yeah. how would you describe it in your experience you know, every time someone asks me, like, what was your why? Why did you want to go out there and do your own thing? And my why has morphed significantly over 13 years. But back then it was very selfish. I didn't want to be told what to do, how to do or when to do it. And I also didn't want a boss anymore. Mm -hmm. I've had all primarily male bosses mm -hmm. and I just was tired of being told what to do and when to do and, and doing it all for somebody else. Yeah. So I knew deeply I wanted mm -hmm. that freedom. So every time it got hard, scary, maybe I shouldn't do this, that paycheck's not coming in anymore. Yeah. I just thought, what do you want and why yeah, do you want yeah. it? Did you ever envision your life? Was there like and I'm saying like an actual mind picture in your mind. Like, this is what my life looks like. Did you have that yes. or was it so, something else? Absolutely. I would see myself all the time. Um, and we lived in a little condo in Carlsbad, California at the time. And I had bought this as a single girl and then got married. And now I had a husband and a stepson living in this tiny yeah. little condo. And I would always picture myself in a big home with tons of palm trees, a pool in the back and working on my laptop in my office. And I just saw the serene setting. I just wanted that so bad. It was something that came up all the time. Fast forward m many years later, and I absolutely had the house, had the office, yeah. had the life that I wanted. And I kind of have to remind myself when I'm complaining or yeah, frustrated, yeah. like, you're living the life that you had only yeah, dreamed yeah. of. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have gratitude in that, right? So but how important is that stopping along the way um, and just saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm doing it. I did, I'm doing what I yes. set out to do. It's so, so important. I had this bizarre feeling the other night. I was laying in bed the night before a big photo shoot and it was like an all day photo shoot for my website. I don't like photo shoots. And so <laughs> I was laying in bed and I was feeling very, very anxious and kind of frustrated. Like, why did I agree to this? It's going to be a long day. I was kind of being a brat. <laughs> and I was talking to myself and I said, Amy, you are in this gorgeous house in Nashville now. Yeah, you have this yeah. super cozy bed. You're safe. You're secure. You have five people showing up tomorrow to take your picture and make sure you look good. <laughs> yeah, to do your you hair. You are just fine. <laughs> yes. To do your makeup. Do your hair, makeup, make sure your day is mm -hmm. wonderful. And I thought, I am so very yeah. fortunate. But that that moment, I would have never really, I don't know if I really ever believed it was possible for me. I'm not the kind of girl that's like, I know that's going to happen. So yeah. here we go. Yeah. I'm just like, let's get into motion and let's just okay. keep moving forward toward it. Help me understand if there was ever a point for you where you were like, I need to let this go. You know, like you got to this point in your corporate career because you were like, K -k 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 -k, yeah. right? Like you were just driving all the time. But in order to take a leap like that, there has to be some kind of understanding of like, I'm not totally in control here. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you do this? Uh, and did yes. you ever have that moment where you're like, I'm just going to do this? Absolutely. It was literally the moment I left my nine to five job. I didn't have a bunch of clients set up. I didn't know how it was going to work. And I sure as I didn't believe in myself like my husband believed in me at mm -hmm. the time. 
I always call it that leap of faith. And I always say, let your why be stronger than your worries. Mm -hmm. And when your worries knock you down and you're afraid and you want to hide under the table, you got to get that why, let it lift you up. In that moment, I was terrified Mm -hmm. to leave my job. I thought for my rest of my life, I'd be a corporate girl. And I was happy that way. Well, it's safe. Yeah, very. It's it's very safe. And And then like you're saying, like you get your, you get your paycheck every two weeks. It's like, you know, and we forget. And I think people, people who haven't started a business don't remember like or they don't realize that where's the money coming from and if i don't generate that we have a problem yes so there has to be a why has to be. there has to be a, a a thing that's motivating and pulling us forward um how do you help you think your students your the people that come to you how do you help them really cultivate the why and help them understand why the why is just such a driving force. Yes. So what I tell them is that why does not need to change the world, at least in the beginning. It doesn't have to be all about everybody else. It could be incredibly selfish, but when you go to bed at night and you want something different, why do you want it? That's where we start. Why do you want it? When you start dreaming of a different life, when you start feeling resentful of the life you have, what do you want instead? Yeah. yeah. So I, I have them start there. And I say, if it, for me, and I remind them, mine was selfish. I didn't want a boss. I didn't want to be told what to do anymore. So a lot of them will start out with like, what do they personally want? It leads to wanting to help other people and help uh, help the world in a big way or a small way. But I allow them to say, let's start with you and why do you want it? And then it starts Mm. to kind of morph over the years. But I also tell them, you absolutely have to have a why because it will get really tough. Yeah, it gets really tough. And then you have to be able to come back to it. Yes. Which is funny. Like that particular reason is why I tell people, I have three children. It's also the reason I tell people not to have three children. (laughs) Because I'm like, because once that third child comes around, you got to be like, this is why I have this child. Yes. I felt it. I knew, you know, so that's like total mom experience coming out right now. Uh, but it's the same thing. Like when things get really hard, if you don't know why you made that choice, what do you have to come back to? It is so And if that easy. wasn't like, I mean, I say it here because this is where I feel it. Like if it wasn't like here or if it wasn't here, how do you know you made the right choice? Which actually is a question I'm going to ask you. If you do you feel where do you feel things? Mm-hmm. Do, where does Amy Porterfield yeah. feel the right decision? I feel it right in my chest all the time, right here. Whether it be the wrong decision, I feel it here, or whether it be the right decision. And it's and I love thinking about where do you feel it? It's so easy to think it, but if you're not feeling it throughout your body, I feel like you're missing something really important. So for me, it's always in my chest, either yeah. tightness or expansiveness feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And do you ever stop to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do I, whoa, mm, I feel the tightness. I feel the constriction. What does this Absolutely. mean? Absolutely. And I ask myself, am I just afraid? Or mm. is my gut telling me I need to go in a different direction? And I've made the wrong decision many, many times. Yeah. But then I'll ask myself, like, okay, where do we go wrong here? Yeah. A ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, I didn't listen to my gut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do want to. I, I want to ask you about that about fear specifically. And I'm glad you brought it up because it's something in my own experience. Just in the last, gosh, in the last few weeks, it's like I was confronted specifically in a in a situation where I I, I someone I know and love, uh, who's a friend, who I just saw. Fear fear in a response they gave to me. It was in something totally unrelated, but it was like their response was like, it was fear. And in like, in my heart, I was like, that's what fear looks like. And so for weeks I've been like, every time something's come out, I've said, is that fear? Is it like, am I saying that out of fear? So how often does fear creep into the decisions we all make? And then how do we combat fear? Certainly in an entrepreneurial journey. So I feel fear all the time. So when I'm making decisions in my business, I am afraid of making the wrong decision or affecting someone in the wrong way or whatever it might be. I fear, I feel the fear all the time. But for me, and I think for many people that keep moving forward, I just know that it's just a normal thing. It is just part of our daily, like we breathe, we eat, we feel fear. (laughs) And so I just think it's very normal. And I made a commitment to myself that I will do it afraid. And I think that's a statement Mm. that some people might just need to make. Oh, Oh, wow. Right? Like, 
I will do it fearful. I will do it afraid, but I'm going to do it. Sometimes people haven't even given themselves permission to do it afraid just yet. And it makes all the difference. Also, I ask myself, so if I don't do this, if I don't move forward, if I don't do this interview, if I don't get on that stage, if I don't do whatever, will I regret it? And Mm. if the answer is yes, then there is no discussion. Yeah. And that's another thing. There's no discussion. I I can't overthink this stuff. If I overthink it, if I let myself go too long with making that decision, I will likely choose fear. So I am someone who will make a decision fairly quickly after looking at the facts. Yeah. And I do I do wonder, too, because, um, you know, I think in, in our society, we're all so like guided to be so analytical, right? To think so much, like, does it make sense? Is it quantifiable? Does it read out on the spreadsheet? But a lot of like jumping out of something secure is not analytical, right? I mean, there, there, and there is fear involved in that. So was there ever a point once you jumped out where you're like, whatever this was, 2008 Amy or 2010 Amy or whenever you're like, I'm out, you know, um, was there ever a point that you thought I've made the wrong choice or were you always like, no, I, this is hard. But I did right. Okay, so there were many times I thought, I did, not that I made the wrong choice, but that I wouldn't be good enough and I'd have to go back for my job. Mm-hmm. I'd always tell my husband, I'm going to have to grovel and beg Tony Robbins to take me back mm-hmm. because we got into debt. My first year of business, my husband decided to be, try to become a firefighter, which he eventually did, but he wasn't making any money. I was barely making any money and we got into debt. So this was 2010. By 2011, I looked at him and I'm like, I have messed up. Like, yeah. I'm not making enough money to support us. You're not making any money. And what did we do? I'm yeah. going to have to go back to my job. Yeah. And he was the one who said, absolutely not. Yeah. We will do whatever it takes to make it work. And it brings me back to everybody needs at least one person to in believe their corner, in you, to believe in us, yeah. one person. And when you're thinking about your dreams, making a big transition, changing things up, I always tell my students, be very selective who you tell. Mm-hmm. Not everybody deserves to hear your dreams. And when you tell someone who, who really won't get it, and they tell you that is risky, that mm. is scary, don't do this. Maybe just try a little hobby on the side and keep with your nine to five. They are projecting their fears on you. Right. It has nothing to do with right. you. So if that were to happen, you just say thank you yeah. and you keep moving yeah. forward. But I also say keep your early dreams close to your heart. Yeah. The thing that's hard about that too is it comes from people who love you and it's said out of love. It is. They want to protect yeah. you. And so it's really hard when someone, I mean, this is speaking from experience, when you want the approval of the person you love, whoever that person is, you want their approval. You want them to to agree with what you're doing. And so when they say, not a good idea, it's hard not to be hurt. I, Did yeah. anyone ever hurt you in that process? I think my dad was very afraid. Here I was an adult. I was in my early 30s, but he was very afraid quit a corporate job like with Tony Robbins making great money why would you ever do that he didn't understand but I I just said dad you gotta trust me I'm not Mm -hmm. happy I need to I need to try something new and I I tried to explain to him why it was important to me I also in my mind I'm like you ain't paying the bills so (laughs) you want to pay all my bills we can have this conversation (laughs) so I I also remind my students they're not paying the bills. They mm-hmm. don't really get an opinion. And so when it's your spouse or someone very close to you, taking the time to explain your why, yeah. your heart is important. Other than that, some people just don't even get an explanation. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you hear from people a lot that say, my spouse does Breaks not. my heart. Yeah. My spouse does not. Uh, they just, they don't get it. They don't, they're, and, and, you know, maybe this person understands why they don't get it, but it's still like, God, there's nothing else I'd want more in this world than to just be supported by my spouse. Like the person you love more in this world than anyone else. Uh, What does someone even do in that situation? So it happens a lot, unfortunately. I work with a lot of women and their husbands don't necessarily understand why they'd want to do that. And so we talk about it a lot. And the first thing is, yes, sharing your heart. But if that still doesn't work, if they choose to move forward, which I do encourage them to do so, um, that is why I think it's important that I create the community. So mm-hmm. in my business, mm-hmm. one of my my things that I feel it's my purpose is to make women be an example of what's possible. Let women know you absolutely can do this, even when not everyone's going to agree with you. 
I was lucky that my husband did, but there's other people in my life that didn't get it. Mm -hmm. So we rally around these women and say, we'll be your support system. I always say I'm their biggest cheerleader. I'll cheer you on when other people are not. But it does take a lot of courage because that is not easy to do something when your spouse, I can't imagine Hobie, my husband, didn't believe in me doing this. It would be harder. Yeah. No, I I do love that. I do love that that's like a tenet of your mission to create community for people because it's something that I want to you too like it's a community around purpose like a community around reclaiming power you yes. know how much power do we have as women how much power we have all the power and we give it away all and we time. forget and we and it's and i think we do it for different reasons i think for some people it maybe it's because you just want to like rock the boat too much you just you know just let's all be together it's okay it's okay it's all right i'll give of myself so that you're happy no big deal i'll give of myself so that you're happy no big deal but what starts happening is you give so much that it's like what have i done like nothing's left and we oh, do yeah. have to like claw that back and there needs to be a community of people that say girl i got you i did that i'm gonna help you back through it right oh so, my like, goodness, to be like yes. a cheerleader for that is so amazing. What a beautiful thing that you're doing. I love that you you talk about that because I was many years into my business and I took on a business partner. And so I almost hit the million dollar mark in my business, met this guy who's younger than me in a mastermind. And we started to talk and kind of he suggested, I suggested we work together, but it became he'll be my business partner. So with a decision very rapidly, I made a decision very rapidly and took him on as a business partner. So here's a business I created, my baby that I birthed, yeah, and right. now I bring this guy in. And we did amazing things together. Changed lives, made great money. It was an amazing experience on paper. But over the years, I was losing a piece mm. of me. I deferred to him for everything. Mm. Now to back up a little bit, I grew up with a really strict father who called the shots. My mom was not the boss of the house, my dad was. And then I go work for a bunch of men in corporate publishing and Tony Robbins and other Harley Davidson, that was all men. And so I work for all these men and I just gave my power away. I really did what you said. And so uh, when I got into this relationship with this partner, I deferred to him about everything. If I was worried, I'd ask him, what do we do? If I wasn't sure of an answer, what do you think we should do? Mm. And all of a sudden, I couldn't even recognize myself in the mirror. Mm. And this is, I was building a multi-million yeah. dollar business and didn't feel powerful right. at all. And so what happened was we got a few years in and I realized this isn't making me happy at all. Yeah. I, I took a walk with a friend and she said, what are you so upset about? And I said, ah, I just, something's off with my business. And she's like, let's talk about your partnership. And I said, absolutely not. Mm. That's off, off topic. Like, like is it because you knew that's I, where it was? Yes. Or like, it was so painful. It you was didn't so want painful, to bring it out. And I knew getting out of it was going to be hard. Yeah. So I thought, no, I can't do anything about that. She looked at me kind of funny, like, really? Yeah. Went to bed that night and thought, oh, great. I, I've got to confront this. Yeah. So I started to talk to my husband about, I want out of the partnership. And we kind of talked about how we we're going to do it. But there was a huge chance I would lose the business. And this is my everything. Like right. I, I, I've I, never given birth to a baby. I have a stepson who I call my own. But I felt like I had birthed that's this yours. business. Yeah. yeah, that's yours. So I went to him and said, I want out. And over the next year, we we battled. We, yeah. we couldn't come to a decision of how are we going to dissolve this business that now was like this. And there it's like was a divorce. It felt like a divorce. You're exactly right. I cried more than I've ever cried in my entire wow. life. And I was crying because I thought, I'm going to lose this. This isn't Every, my name. Is, this everything. is what you look. This is what you left for. Uh, yes. You I built yes. your whole life around this thing. Exactly. And it was doing oh incredibly well. So I could have shut my mouth and just continued mm. because we were making great money. We were changing lives. But I just knew in my gut, you know, as women, we know when mm-hmm. something's not right. And so um, I got to a point that I thought we had to get lawyers involved, uh, mediation, all that. And I thought, I'm going to lose the business. And then I there's the craziest moment. I thought, then I'll start over. Even just telling you now, I get cheers, I'll, uh, <laughs> chills. I'll start oh, over. And I realized I know how to build a business online. I know how to make money. I've done it for now. Uh, by then, it might have been five, six years. And so I thought, I'll start over. And in that moment, all the power came back. Like, was it like oh, warm? Because like yes. hearing you say that, I'm like, it's warm. It was it's just like a warm, warm rush of like power. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And my life changed in that moment because not only did I declare if I lose something, I won't give up on myself. I will start over and I can. Mm -hmm. But also in that moment, I thought, wow, 
I feel like I can do anything. Yeah. Like I, I felt invincible for the first time in my whole life. Mm. And so long story short, we did come to an agreement. We went to mediation. Uh, we came to an agreement. And I, uh, the very next day I woke up in the morning, turned on the radio and danced my butt off <laughs> in my pajamas in my house. Like I did it. This is mine. It's mine. Yeah, I remember yeah. calling my husband and I said, it's ours. It's yeah. if we got it back. Yeah. And it was the best day ever. And you know, I will say something that was the hardest time in my entire business. Mm. I felt like I had messed up. I had made bad decisions. I had lost myself. But I wouldn't change it for the world. One, he was a great partner when we were partners. I have nothing bad to say about him. And two, it allowed me to realize I'm more powerful than I thought. Right, right. There's so much power. Yeah. yeah. And the hard thing, too, with what you built was that's your name. Yeah. Like, it's literally your name. Literally my name. <laughs> it's so, not like yes. some business with different words. Like, it's your name. Yeah. So if the name is not representative of, like, or in the image of, you, yeah. Then that that I'm I can see one thousand percent how that how that would be deeply, uh, deeply disturbing. Yes, because you're like, wow, yes, I'm doing good things, but this isn't this isn't me. Like, who is this? This is not my image. This is someone else's image. And then too, I'm sure you're asking this, yourself the question: How can I help people do this if I myself yes. am not doing it? Who yeah. am I? You know, at that exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah, that's really that's difficult. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to start over. Thank God. So no. you you got to keep going. You got yes. what what changed about your focus or uh, or what did you take away? What did you put in after that time? I'm sure you felt super empowered at that super point. Super empowered. The first thing is I started taking care of myself, my mental yeah. health and my physical health more. I just thought, whoa, if it's just me, I gotta show up as my very best self. Yeah. So I started to put myself first, more so than I ever have in my life. That was a big change because then I started to feel more confident in my skin and who I was. But in addition to that, I started to ask myself, do whatever I was creating in my business, does this feel good? Yeah. Does this feel right? Because if it doesn't feel good, if it's not a hell yes, let's make it a hell no. Yeah. Like, let's not do that. I love that. I've heard that before and I'm like, Oh, yes. Like, I, I just love that because, and again, I think it goes back to our ability as women to just really, I think we are so much um, more attuned. I think in a lot of ways we've forgotten how to tune yes. in and we have to remember. But the moment that we remember is just a very, a very powerful time. I think we're just a lot quicker with the uptake on like following intuition. Uh, but yeah, what, what is that? What is that? Like, if it's not a absolutely... Yes. This is what we're doing. Absolutely. If it's not that, then it needs to be, whoa, 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 yes. whoa. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Take a step back. Because yeah. I'm sure we, we've all made bad choices because oh. something wasn't. And absolutely, this is what we're doing. I've done it more times than I'd like to admit. So I know what it feels like to make that decision and regret it. Mm -hmm. So one, I, my dad always used to say, I like am a caveman because I have, <laughs> because I have to like touch the stone and it's hot yeah. and then realize like, don't do that again. Yeah. I do that in my business. So yeah. I make the mistake and think, well, I'm not going to do that again. I've said yes to many things. And when I know it's not the right yes, is that I feel resentful. I'm mad. Mm. Like, why is why is he sending me that email about this? I don't want to deal with it. Or why why do I have to get on that plane? I'm thinking, first of all, I'm the boss. So mm. if I don't like it, go talk to the boss. <laughs> Your fault. Yes. yes. <laughs> and two, I, that resentful feeling is I, this just wasn't a good fit, but you yeah. decided to say yes. Yeah. How do you handle those conversations? So there have been a few that I actually I just had one recently around my website where we've gone all the way down this road and it does not feel right. It's turned mm. into a monster. There's too many moving parts that I don't love. It doesn't feel right. And I had to send emails out this week that said, mm. with a heavy heart, I'm going to pause this project. Mm. I've learned to pause now instead of saying, no, I'm going to hold oh. different direction. Let's just pause for a moment. Yeah, that's in nice. In my 40s, pausing is possible. In my 30s, I don't know if I could have done it. That's a nice so, tool in the toolbox. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I think to, to, totally as we get older, we acquire more skills, right? We acquire more tools. Yes. And it, I think in my, certainly in my 20s, it was the, the answer was always yes. Yes, I'm going to do that. Yes, I wanted to be so known to be able oh, to do yeah. all those things. You get to 30 and it's like, I can, I can, I can, I can, I can. And then it's like the severing is very hard. But the yes. fact that you can say like now, pause. I'm going to pause. Like you don't have to sever, but let's exactly. maybe pause and reevaluate. Yeah. That's like, to me, a sign of major wisdom, right? Yes. To just be able to say, you guys, we don't have to make a decision, but we are going to take a moment. And then really pay attention to how it 
feels when you pause. I sent that email and I felt bad. I was letting people down. I'm in Enneagram too. I don't want to let people down. I want to make everyone happy and help everyone. But I knew I was letting people would be very disappointed with my decision. I was well aware. And I, I sent the email and I felt their disappointment. But then I asked myself, how do I feel in this pause? I felt very calm. Yeah. And I knew it was right. How does an Enneagram too? Because I have a deeply, deeply loved person in my family is an Enneagram too and wants to think she's not an Enneagram too. <laughs> but even still, how does an Enneagram too decide that they can overcome their need to please others and still do for themselves. <sighs> Lifelong Oops, journey. Lifelong journey. So I always want to be a three. Most of my <laughs> friends are threes. Are you a three? Uh, uh, funny I discussion okay. on okay. lots of things. Go okay, ahead. Okay, got it. <laughs> so um, I, when when I get to the point that I know I want to make everyone happy, I know I'm going to let people down if I don't do this, or I want everybody to like me. And then I ask myself, is that truly going to help people in this world if I want to be everything for everybody? Because what I learned in marketing in my business, if you're for everybody, you're for nobody. Mm. So I take more of a work, a business type of set, mindset around that. Like if I'm trying to be everything for everybody else, I'm going to water down my message. I'm going to water down myself and I'm never going to show up truly who I am. But many times I find myself, are you just doing this because you want to make that person happy or you don't want to disappoint I literally have to stop and ask myself do I guess do, it comes back to that pause yeah do you do you do it often do you or are you better at that now oh way better now but it still shows up yeah but years ago I would just do it to make them happy yeah, I stayed yeah, in that yeah. partnership because I didn't want to disappoint him yeah so I did it way more than and then it just became like I don't want this quality of life this right. isn't making me happy right and I wonder I mean it, it's antithetical to the freedom that you started everything for to begin right. with right and I do wonder I want to bring it back to the like sensation of all of that did was that something you felt here again oh absolutely so when I know I'm doing it to just because I want to make someone else happy or not disappoint very tight in my chest yeah. I can feel it comes up in my throat and then when I do it for me or for the right reason Oh, I could just breathe. Yeah, yeah. And you probably can sleep, right? Oh, Are yeah. you someone that uh, has a trouble sleeping at all? <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> okay. I don't sleep really great, but I always make a point to get eight hours. Yeah, okay. And so um, I just do my very best. Yeah. But my mind's going a lot. I know. I think I think that's a problem, right? Like, for me, I don't know what you've come across that, like, helps you. I have found, I've always been a very active person, so I've always run or I've danced or I've done all sorts of things. But, like, for me, yoga mm -hmm. is the absolutely only thing that I've found that, like, totally clears my mind because so I mean great. they'll say in yoga it's like this is this is a uh, open eye meditation is what what mm. my teachers always say open eye meditation and I think it took me a long time to understand what that really meant but like having somebody force you to focus you know yes. having someone force you to look in a mirror and accept whatever showed up today you know like that's, that's powerful it's a it's an empowering practice if you let it be. So what have you found in your rest, in your self-care that allows you to go, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. This is oh, what I'm going to do Oh my goodness. Right now. Absolutely meditation. I don't do yoga, but meditation on the call map. And it's funny you should say that because this morning I was doing a meditation on worry. So mm. worry is something that since I've been a really little girl, I worry about everything. Now, now I know how to manage it, but it still comes up in business and whatnot. And I was listening to this meditation and at the end she said, let me take a line from Winnie the Pooh. And she said, Piglet was in a forest and he looks at Pooh and he says, Ass assuming that this tree is going to fall and fall right on us when we're under it. And then are supposing this tree is going to fall. And Pooh says, supposing it doesn't. Mm. And in that moment, I, I heard that and I thought, mm. every thought I have that what if this happens? Worry is what if this happens yeah, in yeah, the future? Yeah. What if it doesn't? Yeah. And my coach always says, I have always had a business coach. And she says, you have to give equal play time. If, to the, if you're going to go negative, you have to give equal play time to the positive. So oh. if you're going to think, what if all this stuff happens? Well, what if it happens a totally different way in your favor? Yeah. That yeah. equal play time has allowed me to let go of that worry. And it has allowed me to sleep better because I let it all just go. Yeah. But meditation and journaling. Journaling for 
10 minutes a day. I don't actually love it, but I love how it makes me feel. Kind of like exercise for me sometimes. I do it because I like the effect of it, yeah, you know, the result. Yeah. So I journal 10 minutes a day and that I, has helped immensely. I wonder if you have gone back to your journal to like start to put some of your writing together. Yes. Like, is, was that a source for you at all? Absolutely. So when I recently wrote a book, it's coming out next year, and I went back to some notes I had in different old journals and they all of it was a lot of fear, a lot of courage, a lot of doubt, a lot of action. Mm. And so I, I kind of weaved all that into the stories I told throughout the book. But going back, I feel like a totally different person yeah. today. Do you think that surprises people when you expose fear? I do. I know some of my students will say, I look at you and you've got, you know, the life you want and the business you want and you're a leader in your field. And that seems like you got, it's easy for you. Right. But when you tell us to have courage, it's easy for you to say. And I remind them, yeah. oh, 13 years ago, I was terrified every day. <laughs> so you have to start somewhere. Yeah. But I often tell my older stories to remind my students I was literally exactly mm -hmm. where they're at. How do you live? How do you live in the past? And here's what I'm saying. How do you live in the past where you can constantly connect to that? but still allow yourself to push to the future and say, wait, there's more. I'm still pushing for more. How do you, how does Amy Porterfield mm. do that? Like connect those two things or, or is it even a toggle that you have to make? You know, I, I don't, I, that's a great question. I think I'm always looking forward into what do I want to do? I'm, I'm a big goal setter. So I'll set those goals. I'll put my sights forward. And when I, feel scared. I'm often looking back at mistakes I've made or where I've come from and how hard that was and to build this business. And I just tell myself, I'm not going to live there. So I try not, I'll tell my stories, but I try not to live. Yeah. Live there. In the story. Yeah. Because it will definitely take me back. Yeah. That's interesting. Where was a, where was a point or a time that you were like, Oh crap, this is really happening. Like oh, people are actually listening to what I have to say. And Oh my God, I'm making a difference. Like, yes. was there a point for you that was like that? Oh my gosh. I've had many, many points along the way. I think if I go back to my early, early days, so I sell digital courses teaching people how to do marketing. And so with that, I remember my first successful launch. I had a few failed launches along the way, <laughs> but my first successful one. And I remember that not only did we make great money, but my students were getting results and mm. they were sharing their results. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is actually yeah. working, which is a little scary that I put out a product, not sure if it was going to work or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for any course creator, the first time someone says this worked and I did it, you're like, thank God. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. it worked for you. And so yes. you're trying to put out your experience, but you hope it translates. Oh, it's a very scary feeling. But it's the stories from my students. Like I have a woman that I work with. She's from LA, three kids, lives in a home with not enough bedrooms for the kids. And she has her mom live with her as well. And she is a baker. Mm -hmm. And she took one of my courses to learn how to create a digital course. And she does caramel candy apples. And she created a course teaching other people how to make caramel caramel candy apples. This woman was working two jobs and was a single mom, so doing it all by herself. And then she creates this business and today her entire life is different and she looks different. She shows up yeah. different and her goal is to retire her mom. And that's mm. my most favorite thing ever. When I hear those stories, I'm just like, I'm doing, I'm living my purpose. I, I never thought of you as someone who did women focused businesses until now I'm sitting down with you and I'm thinking, Oh no, no, this is very women focused. Was that an intention? You know, it's a great question. I have a lot of gentlemen in my courses, but I do gear more toward women. And the, there's this thing, you know, I was, I was recently interviewed with a bunch of women in the audience, but men on the panel with me. And I was saying <laughs> how I didn't want a boss. I didn't want a man telling me what yeah, to do, when yeah. to do and how to do it. You're like, no and offense. Yeah. And they were kind of a little offended. And I thought, I got to be careful how I talk about this. I love men and I have no yeah, problem yeah. with men, but I also think that it sometimes women need another woman to say, let me show you how I did it because the way the men do it, it's very different in my industry very different how a man markets versus a woman very different so i wanted to be an example of what's possible but also come from a very female perspective mm. and it's a different conversation so but i am careful about it in my marketing because i never want a gentleman or non-binary person to think that mm. they don't belong in my community right but my heart is with the ladies yeah 
Tell me about your tattoo. I keep seeing this oh, tattoo. Tell me what it yes. says. So it says love you more. And it's actually a tattoo I got my husband to agree to have a, a matching <laughs> one, which I can't believe he got this on his arm. <laughs> but when we first met, he said, I love you. And I was very nervous. And for about 15 minutes, didn't say it back. So when I did <laughs> say it, he said, I will always remind you I love you more because oh. you didn't say it back. So now when I say I love you, he says I love you more. So oh, I got I a tattoo. It. So it's matching. Does he have it he also on, it, his it, on his arm too, which I can't believe he did it but he did that's yeah. great uh, do you have any other tattoos i don't just one yeah it's funny because i feel like most people once they get one they're like now i'm addicted I, everything that it, like everything that's super meaningful gets put on i can't imagine i would do that for some reason i really wanted this but i don't think i'll get another you won't get like the logo of your business or like <laughs> the most not. the most uh, successful digital course on like your shoulders <laughs> no <laughs> that's a joke that's a joke i'd never expect that if you did i'd be like wait that's really? a little weird yeah. really it's a little weird um where does does Amy Porterfield take Amy Porterfield from here? And is that separate from just Amy? Mm. You know, I'd like to say it's separate from just Amy. And, and I think that would be actually a little bit more healthy. But I started this business with a huge desire to go out on my own and make it work. So Amy Porterfield Inc. feels very close to just Amy the girl. I feel like we're one in the same. I don't work my life away. I do four day work I know. a week. And I love that you do that, by the way. And I'm sure yeah. your employees are like, heck yes. It's so figuring amazing. It out, you know? And I employ 20 full time people, and 19 of them are women. Most of them are mamas. And mm -hmm. I love that they get to see their moms be in leadership positions and do big things. My my employees run the business like it's their own and, and that makes me so excited. But I am very closely tied to what I do in my business. And what I want more than anything is to reach more women. So I've, be, I've been very well known in the internet marketing space or how to create digital courses space. I want a woman that's never even heard of me to learn that she's got another path if she wants it. Yeah. And every day I think about there's this woman in a cubicle working her butt off, doing amazing work. She's super talented. Making a lot of money Make, for somebody yes, else. Yes, yes. <laughs> making a lot of money for someone else. And she has this knowing that there's got to be another life for me. There's yeah. got to be. But she has no idea how to start it. And that's why I wrote my book because I thought... I want her to stumble across this book, not have any idea who I am, but know that, oh my gosh, there's a whole other life out there if yeah. I want it. And just to be curious enough, just right. be curious enough to explore it, even though you're not sure what you would even do. Yeah. Does curiosity rule the day, you think? Is oh, that like the, the absolutely. questions? Absolutely. I really do. Get curious. If you have that feeling like there's got to be something else, what is it then? Yeah. Start looking, start finding what it yeah. might be. And I think that you've got to dabble a little to figure out what it might be. Yeah. And I mean, certainly this is like where all of this came from, right? Like for me in my own personal experience, it's like I got to this point, um, you know, I've, I've got all of the awards. I've got kids. I've got a loving husband. I've got, you know, the, the, the accolades, right, that go along with it. And then it's like, wow, me looking around, feeling incredibly ungrateful to ask this question, but now like de-shaming the question, which is, is this it? Yes. Is this, is this it? Yes. Like I did everything I was supposed to do. Is this it? And realizing, wow, okay, for me, that became a signifier that, that there was more. There was more and I needed to find it. And what is that, right? So it started with questions. All of the questions, the questions that I could never answer, the ones that I pushed down yes. that I wouldn't allow myself yes. to answer. And finally going, if I don't answer them now, who am I? Yeah. Who am I? What do I have to bring if I'm not brave enough or courageous enough to answer the questions? You it's know? so true. Do you want to play a game? Yeah. Okay. So I've got these questions that I like to ask every single person that comes and sits okay. down in the chair that you're sitting down in. Okay. Okay. So um, you may not see it as a game, but I see it as a game. <laughs> I get so we'll very start. nervous in these moments. Okay. Well, just it's <laughs> all you have to answer is like the things that are authentic to you. Okay. Like you're the only one who knows Easy the enough. answer. So whatever you answer is the, right, the right answer. right answer. Okay. So when was the best time in your life? The best time in my life would be when I quit my job. I think it's the best time. Although it's the hardest time, there's no better feeling than, oh my God, I did it. Yeah. Okay. How about the worst time? When was the worst time in your life? Getting out of that partnership. That was mm. the worst time in all of my life. Did you lose a lot of sleep, cry a lot of tears? Uh, lots of tears, lots of fear. Yeah. yeah. How, how many months did that last? I'm it just lasted curious. about a year. Oh, wow. So yeah, it was, a, it was a big experience. What is something about your nature that you've either overcome or you continue to overcome? It's that worrying. That, yeah. that feeling of always being worried, 
uh, what's going to happen? What if I make a wrong turn? So that's why I do a lot of the meditation and journaling. Yeah. I just journal out the worries. Yeah. Good. Good yeah. for you. Uh, when was there a turning point in your life that you're like, everything's different now? Like, here it is. So when I got out of the partnership, about two weeks later, I was on stage at my own event and I wasn't planning to sell anything, but I needed to pay for the partnership to end. Yeah. So I thought, real talk, here we go, here we go. <laughs> so I remember getting on stage, we had created an opportunity for this audience and it was a high ticket, $5,000 opportunity, nothing wow. I've ever sold before. And I just thought, if you want that, if you wanted this bad, you wanted this to end here you go let's go and i don't love selling on stage but i also love pushing myself to do things i need to do in that moment i felt different and i knew we were going to do something different and that changed everything that day did it translate it absolutely did <laughs> paid the bills and people still talk about that one special event i did so oh. that's good oh i love that yeah um when was a, a moment of clarity for you where you were like oh everything makes sense now Mm, such a great question. A moment of clarity. You know, I moved from California to Nashville a year ago, and I talk publicly about this on my podcast. I went through a really bad depression and anxiety. Um, once I've, you got here? Once I got here. I'd, and I've gone through that low level on and off in my life, but this was like roaring. And I think, this sounds so silly, but the weather affected me immensely. I'm a hey, Southern California girl. Hey, dude, okay, <laughs> listen, I'm from South Carolina and I moved here and I'm like, it's so great. <laughs> What's all the, the rain? It gets me. Thank you. It's sad. Me. Yeah. Seasonal affective disorder is a real okay. thing. I had it. At, like, <laughs> I, I didn't know that was a thing, but I'm like, why am I so sad? Yeah. And then we moved into a home that needed a lot of work and I, w I didn't have any friends and the whole thing I was like oh my gosh I think I made a wrong decision so for a year I felt really really bad and then I said I cannot continue to feel this way we're not mm. going back to California we're going to make this work yeah. and I started to do the work on myself work out more eat better the meditating the journaling getting a, a, a life coach I did all the things and I feel so dramatically different. I feel clear, I feel oh, focused, and I know I'm supposed to be here, but that took a good year. So that clarity has come like over the last year, plus writing this book and getting yeah. all the stories, all the teachings I wanted out. I feel really grounded in that. I love so, that for you. Thank you. Why did you move to Nashville? So I wanted, my husband and I wanted to make a change. We yeah. wanted to kind of, our son went away to college yeah. and we thought, well, now or never, let's do it. <laughs> and I thought it was just such a fun, great idea. Little did I know I'd struggle as much as I did. He's thriving. He looks yeah. like a mountain man, country man, and full beard. And <laughs> he looks like really sexy as a Southerner, but I struggled. Yeah. Um, what is something that you find yourself saying a lot lately? Any particular phrases or words coming out of your mouth? I've already won. So I say this one a lot. I've already won. I have a good girlfriend. We voice text every day about business stuff. She's like uh, my mentor and I'm her mentor kind of thing. And we talk every day. And when I'm struggling with something, she'll remind me, you already won. You're doing it. You're in it. You're making it happen. I love that. And I love that because I just own where I'm at right now. No matter what happens or what happened in the past, right now, I'm doing good. I'm fine. Yeah. So I love that. What is your purpose? My purpose is to help that woman in that cubicle to, to realize there is something else out there for you and you are absolutely capable of creating the life in the business you absolutely desire. Yeah. So my purpose is that she finds me, she finds my message. So I'm doing everything in my power to do so. And do you feel that? Oh, I when you talk about that so woman here. Yes, I just know her. I feel her and I have been her. And that's yeah. like the magic of it. I know everything she's thinking and feeling right now. So if I could be an example of what's possible, I want to make sure she knows that she's capable. And the last question with our fun little game is when did you realize your purpose was your purpose? You know, it probably wasn't until about two years ago. And mm -hmm. I think this is an important question. And I want some people to hear this, that I didn't know my purpose when I started my online business. I didn't know my purpose years into it. I knew what I was good at. I knew I could help people. But today when I wake up, I think of her every day. Mm -hmm. And that happened about two years ago when I started to explore the book and the topic I wanted yeah. to write about. I thought, oh, this is what I meant to do. So it took me a very long time. Yeah. I'm curious specifically about, about the book. Why do you think you needed to write that message 
at that point you started and why release it now? So there, when I quit my corporate job, there's no roadmap. I didn't have any women to talk to. I didn't know how they did it. And so I, I was winging it the whole time and it was pretty messy. If I had a guidebook to someone, not only taught me how to quit a job and how to start something new, but then the book literally teaches you how to do an online business. So it's mm. very uh, field work kind of thing. And there's not a lot of women who have written business books like this. So I yeah. thought, I'm going to go because I know that it could be so very valuable. Yeah. And I do love everything about uh, your communication style is so encouraging. I just love that. I, I love so. that in everything you write and everything you do. It's, hey, if this doesn't work for you, no problem. Guess what? I'm still cheering you on. Yes. And every time I read that in your stuff, I'm like, yes, she is. <laughs> yes, she is. Like, it just feels very authentic. And I think it does come back to this idea of creation of community around this, like, this realization, this understanding that, yeah, yeah, you've got, you're pretty powerful. Absolutely. You know, you're pretty powerful, girl, and I'm here for you. So very true. <laughs> yes. Amy Porterfield, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.